Praise the Lord. Happy Father's Day. Praise the Lord. We are blessed to have good fathers, great fathers, grandfathers. Praise God. And uh, we are so blessed that yesterday we had a powerful Maximize Manhood Men's Summit. <laughs> you know what? I've never seen so many men only in this auditorium, in this sanctuary. <laughs> Men only, and I was told we have 205 men only. Where are you, men? Can hear you. Where are you, men? <laughs> oh, we are. We were so blessed, and. Uh, some of the people came all the way from Modesto, from uh, Stockton, from uh, Sacramento. One of them came all the way from Sac Sacramento and they got here at about uh, probably 7.15 or so. And the gate was still closed and, and he prayed, Oh, I hope the seminar is not cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> oh. God is great, and I'm I'm so honored. I'm 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 pleased, privileged to introduce our speaker today, and uh, his name is Dr. Paul Lewis Cole, and today he is, is coming with his wife, and uh, Dr. Paul Lewis Cole is a president of Christian Men's Network Worldwide, and founding pastor of C3 Church in Dallas, Texas. Paul is the son of Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole. How many of you have heard that name? the founder of the Christian Men's Network and the considered father of the Christian Men's Movement. Christian Men's Network leads a global men's movement active in over 100 nations. Come on. <laughs> wow. And connecting over 1 million trained leaders on every continent. Praise the Lord. Paul writes, travels extensively, and speaks to thousands of men annually. The demand for his leadership and expertise has taken him to over 60 nations, and uh, he has been to Indonesia several times already, and is going again this October. Praise the Lord. And um, encouraging and advance, advance, advancing the men's movement around the world. Paul has written several books used in the uh, Christian Men's Network's foundational Maximized Manhood curriculum, including Daring, A Call to Courageous Manhood. And I want to encourage all of you, um, especially men, and I want to encourage uh, wives to also buy the books for your husbands. Or you can also buy books for your friends. Amen? can hear you. Where are you? You still alive? All right. And uh, as president of the uh, CMN Christian Men's Network, Paul has positioned the ministry as a key leader in building a network of mentors who are training young men. How many young men we have in the house? In character building principles across the U.S. and around the world. With that, why don't you stand on your feet? Let's welcome, give a warm, warm city blessing. Welcome. Amen. Yeah, come on. Let's do it for Jesus. Come on. God, you're awesome. You're a true, true father. Love you with all of our hearts. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to three or four people as you're seated and say, you look great today. Just turn to three or four people. You look great today. Awesome place. Man, I love, the, I love the music. You have a great worship team. Great music team. Love them. Man, you sit in that same seat yesterday too, didn't you, man? You get, what, to, what do you get here during the Indonesian service? Just get this. You get here at 8 o'clock this morning and sit through the whole thing just to have that seat. Hey, um, what a great day yesterday. My heart's so full. Uh, Pastor, I think you counted. I, I was in the middle of it. I think you counted around 50 men up here accepting Christ yesterday in this house, recommitting their lives. Come on, give it up for the Lord. Is that awesome? 
And uh, pretty psyched up about that. Pretty, pretty, uh, man, I'm just uh, pumped about the whole thing. And it's a great place to be. Great church. Love your pastors, Paul and Joyce. Ton, they're awesome. You have two of the greatest pastors in the entire world. Can you just give them a hand? They're awesome. And uh, the whole team had a great time with the whole team. Just had a blast. And I uh, want to mention, it's Father's Day. And uh, man, I love being a dad. Love being a grandpa, abuelo, papa, the kids call me. And uh, man, I love that whole thing. I remember when my uh, youngest son, Bryce, was... Uh, about seven years old, and I'm putting them to sleep one night, and uh, three children, and we have five grandchildren. Uh, and my wife, my amazing, spectacular, sensational wife is with me now. Her name is Judy. She's right here. Give her a hand. Come on, help me out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, here's the deal. We don't know exactly how this point system works, ladies. We just know there is one, right? We just, we just, and so help me out there. So, And... Uh, but our youngest son, Bryce, was about seven, and uh, he was, we were playing basketball, you know, and grew up doing that. And he's about seven years old, and we just played a game. And, of course, when your dad and your boys are eight and seven, you're not, like, killing them, you know. You're just trying to let them win a little bit to affirm them. And, and so we're going to, to bed and putting them in bed, and, and my son looks at me, and he goes, Dad, he's seven years old, he says, Dad. Think of how good my son is going to be at basketball. I said, really? And I'm thinking, that's so awesome. He's seven years old. He's thinking generationally. You know, and I'm thinking, this is awesome. Just think about how good my son's going to be at basketball. I said, really? That's awesome. He goes, yeah, because think of how much better I am than you are. <laughs> it's a true story, right? True story. And I'm like, let's go right now. Out, outside. Come on. Get up. Out of bed. We're turning the lights on. We're going to go. And, uh, but isn't that cool? And I love that. And God's a generational God. And John 3.16, I believe, is a Father's Day scripture. It says this, for God so loved. Everybody say loved. loved. We talked about it yesterday with the men. And by the way, ladies, if your husband was here or your boyfriend or your son and friend, man, whatever, if, if he was here, we worked on him as hard as we could. <laughs> it was like, it was intense, wasn't it, Pastor? It was like, wasn't it, Tom? It was like, bam! And, and uh, Big Tommy was here. We broke stuff. We bent things. The guy blew up a hot water bottle yesterday. Boom! It was awesome. Woke up, Tom. You woke up right in the middle of that, didn't you? It was awesome. <laughs> and I believe that John 3.16 is amazing father scripture. I love this music team. I love the spirit. I love the things, not just what they sang, but the things they were saying that were, it was coming out of their heart as they spoke. And they were talking about how good God is and that he's a father, a daddy father. And, and God told us to call him that. It's a fascinating thing. We're going to explore that, unpack that just a little bit today. But for God so loved the world that he, that he what? Come on, help me out. That he what? That he gave. Now think about that. The essence of loving is always shown in giving. Always shown in giving. And, and so God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then his son said, and we'll talk about this today, that when you see Jesus, people say, well, what's God like? You know, what's, how is, what, what's God like? How does he act? Who is this God? And, and sometimes I think the problem some people have with Jesus is they're not sure about his dad. Because they've been told what God is like. And they've got images of God, this religious image that, that here's this, you know, it's usually this old white-haired guy with like a stick. Right? You know what I'm talking about? He's like a stick and he's like, up, bam, you did wrong. It's like, oh, hey, look at you, man. Boom. You know, and we get the sense that God's this guy, old guy, waiting for us to mess up. And But the Bible says, and Jesus said this, he said, when you see me, you see the Father. So if we want to know what God is like, we look at the life of Jesus. In fact, we look at his character, his attributes, how he acted towards people who were caught in sin, Right? What he did with a woman who was caught in adultery, cast at his feet, and the law said, we're going to kill her. 
And he looked at her and said, no, 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 no. She's one of my daughters. I came to give my life for her. And she looked in his eyes, and for the first time, she saw the eyes of a man who looked at her, not out of lust, but out of love, and said, you know what? You're good. I love you. Nobody's going to kill you because I came that you would have life. And Jesus said in John 10, 10, and I know it's Jesus because it's the red letters. <laughs> Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come to give you life and life more abundant, or life to the fullest is another translation. And what he's really saying to me in my life as a father, as we talk about Father's Day and my having a father who was engaged in my, in my life, he, he's saying, listen, I came that you would have life and life to the fullest. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief comes to rip off your view of who God is. See, the thief comes to steal your dreams. It's not just about killing your life. It's about neutralizing your dreams. Taking those desires and dreams, according to Ephesians 2.10, that God put in you. And the thief comes to steal those desires and dreams, the things God put in you before you were ever born, the Bible says. So the thief has come not just to stop you from going to church, it's like, oh yeah, the enemy got in there, man, stopped me from going to church last week. No, dude, you just didn't get up in time. It's like, it's like you know, that little alarm thing on your phone? You just set it a little earlier, right? Come on, somebody, right? And so, so yeah, well, the enemy really got in there, man, you know. No, you stayed up till 4 a.m. playing video games. Come on, somebody. It's like, no, the enemy got in there. No, you were an idiot. All right, I gotta chill out. This is a very conservative, very proper place. So I gotta, I gotta be chilled on this thing, okay? So, uh, but here's, here's the thing God put desires and dreams in you because He's your Father. And because the same way I looked at my son and said, you know what, dude? You will be better than I ever was. I told my son that I hugged him, kissed him goodnight. Somebody asked me one, once, what's the best thing a father can ever do for their children? Because I'm involved in this men's movement. And, you know, I was in business most of my life, but my father had started this in 1977 at his kitchen table in Costa Mesa, California. And now uh, it's gone around the world, and the Lord's touching fathers and raising up dads. So we believe every child deserves a loving dad. Can I get an amen on that? Or a that's good or a way to go or something like that. Here's the thing. I... I believe, you know, as, as I kissed my son and told him he was, he was going to be better, I believe that. I believe that's what God believes about us. Amen. See, I believe that God has, a, has desires and dreams for us, a plan for mankind and a purpose for our lives to be so much larger than where we find ourselves today. Amen. I believe he's that God. I believe he's the God who loves us and never lets us go. In fact, I want to read a scripture towards that end. Everybody doing okay? I just kind of went, I just kind of started. Is that all right? We just, I didn't do the whole preamble thing. But, uh, but I do want to say this. I want to I uh, say hi to everybody who's watching online. I want to say hi to Rob in Missouri. I got a text that says, hey, we're watching. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And uh, so uh, say hi to everybody online. In fact, text somebody right now and say, hey, check it out. <laughs> you know, this is a great church. You should be here next week. So it's not about just coming to church, it's about being connected with our Father. And see, we, when we find that, and we'll unpack that a little bit today, when we find that place, we find our true identity. And here's the loving extravagance of our Father. Because for my children, I wanted them to have everything, right? I wanted them to have all this, in fact, I wanted them to have all the stuff I never had. Maybe I gave him too much stuff. Judy's down here going, yeah, maybe, maybe so. But the fact is, here's what our Father says. Ephesians 1.3, write it down. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, everybody say, blessed us, yes. with every spiritual blessing. Say, every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual. This is awesome. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He is an extravagant father. Extravagant. In fact, listen to this. 
When you first became a follower of Christ, the Bible teaches us there's then a process of discipleship or conversion to move our minds from thinking always with a foundation or platform of negativity to a place where we're positive or thinking the thoughts of Christ or the Word of God is our default. In other words, the first thing that comes up under pressure is what you've stored in your heart, right? And some of us need, need to change some of that. Would you agree? But here's the beauty of, of that process and that changing and that conversion process. It's called being a disciple. Is this, is the Bible says that when you first become a follower of Christ, no matter your background, no matter where you came from, no matter where you grew up, no matter what's happened to you or anything you've ever done, it says you are then in that moment full of the Holy Spirit of God himself. And it says the fullness of God is in you. And in fact, it says the hope of glory resides in you. It's an interesting picture where in Christ and he's in us, fully consumed by the presence of God. That means everything you need to be fully successful, walking out, being a follower of Christ, you already have. You already have access. Bible says we have access as if he is our father because he said, pray this way. Jesus said, pray this way, our, our what? Fascinating, Dina, we talked, Pastor Dina, we talked about it yesterday, didn't we? We talked about what a father is and how so many people, because they have a filter on what the word father means, we miss what God wants for us. He's a good father. In fact, let me take you to another scripture in Hebrews 13, 5. This is... This is this is all the, the preamble, all right? Hebrews 13, 5, uh, section B, the second part, in the Amplified, and I want to give you this in the Amplified. Look at that. In the Amplified, it starts with, for he God himself has said. Now, here's, here's the full thing. For he God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not. You see that three times? In the original language, it's only used two times in the New Testament. It's actually a covenant word, or a, it was a business word that meant a legal covenant. Because in that culture, the, the elders of the city would sit in the city gates on particular days. And if you had a business deal, you'd show up, and you'd show up with the person you're doing business with. And in front of those witnesses, you would say what the deal was, and then you would repeat it three times. And then you would repeat three times, I, I owe you the money. And the man says, here's how much money. And you would repeat it in front of witnesses three times. And when it was done three times, it became a legally binding document. So the word used here, see, in, in a lot of our translations, it says in Hebrews 13, 5, for God has said, I will be there for you. And what happens is with that self-talk filter of father on top of that, we sort of look at it like the person who said, hey, I'll be there the next time you move apartments. And then they weren't there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, everybody said, hey, I'll be there. When is that, Saturday? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, couldn't make it. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Don't point to that guy. It just was like, yeah, he's sitting over there. But God's not the one who doesn't show up. God says, I'll be there for you. And in fact, he made it a legally binding covenant. He said, I will not, I will not, I will not. In fact, let's read this together out loud. Ready? Go. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Somebody say amen. amen. That's our Father. Fact is, you are not alone. You're not alone. In creation, we see the earth was, it says the earth was without form and void. There was darkness on the earth. In some translations, the underlying meaning, you see it means chaos. There was chaos on the earth. Anybody ever lived through chaos? Come on, just touch the person next to you and say, he's talking to you right now. He's talking to you right now. Now, the men who were here yesterday know that was different yesterday. Right? It was hit the guy next to you. Yeah, it was a men's meeting. It wasn't a church service. And so, uh, yeah, we had a lot of hitting, standing, high-fiving. It was a guy thing. And the fact is, is that 
when God said he would be there, he said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. What he's saying to us is that no matter where you are, no matter what's happening, there could be chaos in your life, there can be problems, there can be issues. He says, I'm there. Because in creation it said there's chaos, there's darkness, right? And then it says the Spirit of God was hovering where? Where? You're a Bible guy, right? He was, it says he was hovering right there over the earth. In other words, in the worst moment of your life, you're as close to God as you'll ever be in your life. He's right there. And it says one word, boom, it says, then God spoke, bam, the Holy Spirit was there, ready, ready. Right, Pastor? Ready. Over the earth, over chaos, over the trouble in your life, over the stuff, over the things that were happening. And the word says, one word from God, let there be Come on, somebody. Let there be light. And I believe God's speaking that over our lives today. Right now. No matter where you are, what's happening in your life, what you're walking through, where you've ever been, whatever's happened to you, God says, let there be light. And the Bible says in John, it says, Jesus came as what? As the light. We know in thermodynamics and we know in, in uh, quantum physics, uh, we know that, that light is what holds everything together. Right? Colossians says that in him is everything created, and by him is everything held together. So Jesus came as the one who holds everything together. And without him, everything falls apart. Is somebody say an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Good stuff. Man, I'm feeling pumped up, Pastor. This is great. You told me two o'clock, right? All right, this is awesome. I'm loving it. Somebody over here just went, did, did he really say that? So, uh, I have one phrase I want to leave with us today. One phrase that, that if we can get this into our hearts and minds and spirits, I want uh, my desire, and as Judy and I prayed over this, our desire is that this comes, becomes so part of our hearts that next Thursday or a week from Thursday or Wednesday night late when you're going through some sort of issue, this phrase comes up and it is, I am right now. Everybody say it. I am right now. Say it again. I am right now. Would you stand up with me? And I want to pray over this and read this scripture and, and just finish this up, unpack it. I am right now. I am right now. One phrase. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. So I want us to sort of look at a, one thing that happened in the life of Jesus Christ. And it's found in the book of John. John 11. Flip your phone to it right now your digital Bible. I heard some analog. That's awesome. I heard a couple of pages turn. Where's the analog people? Nobody raised their hand. Yeah, you got one over here. Awesome. Way to go. Actual paper. Remember those? John 11, verse 21. I want to set the scene, and I also want to use a particular translation to bring something out of this, and then we're going to pray over it sort of unpack this thing. So it's an amazing moment because there's a friend, a close friend of Jesus named Lazarus. Lazarus is such a close friend of Jesus that he goes, that he said to him, hey, we're just going to be friends. I won't make you a disciple. In other words, you're not going to be working for me. We're just going to hang out. He lived in a place called Bethany. It's about six miles from Jerusalem, sort of up a hill. And in fact, you remember that part where Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem and it was the day before then that he went on trial and all those things happened. You know that story? He actually was coming from Lazarus's house. So these guys are buds. They're friends. And there's amazing stories when you look in the context of that of Jesus and his friend Lazarus. And here's the one moment. And I, I uh, find it humorous because I'm, I'm thinking, when you read these things, read it as these are real people and uh, this really happened. You know, put yourself in this. So here's Jesus and he gets word that Lazarus, his best friend, is dying. This guy is about to die. And Martha and Mary, had, the two sisters of Lazarus, send word to Jesus. Jesus is about an eight-hour walk away, you know, or, or about five miles by car on the 60, right? So he's about an eight-hour walk away. And uh, he doesn't show up. And they send word again and said, hey, 
your best friend, Lazarus, is about to die. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got the message. They're like, no, 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 you don't understand. He's about to die. He goes, no, I, I got it. And he stays there. And it says that he doesn't get there till four days later. All right? So that's the scene. And what we see in John 11, verse 21, is Martha comes running out. Now, Martha, if you look at the, in the context of their lives, Martha is the task person. She's the one with the list, making sure everything's set up right. And she's not happy that Jesus, her brother's best friend, didn't show up. So they hear, hey, Jesus is coming. So Martha goes, oh, yeah? And she runs out to talk to him. She goes out to meet him. This is a great moment. And here's what happens. Martha says, Master, now, now we read this sort of like this. I'll show you. Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. And we sort of read that like that. But I think it was more like this. Martha is sort of going, hey, dude, if you had been here, what's up? Where were you? Come on, are you kidding me? Jesus, I thought you guys were friends and you didn't show up and he's dead. Now, what up with that? <laughs> She's not happy, right? This is not just, oh, holy, thou art the Messiah, stained glass guy. <laughs> She's mad. So, okay, where were you? Anybody ever feel like that? Come on, <laughs> just get real, right? Anybody ever feel like that? So here's Martha. Here's us going, Jesus, if you'd have been here. And Jesus says, your brother will be raised up. Martha doesn't wait for the rest of it. She goes, oh, I know that. He'd be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. And look at this in verse 25 and 26 in the message translation. It says this. I love this. Jesus says, you don't have to wait for the end. I am right now resurrection and life. Everybody say it. I am. Come on. I am. I am right now. You don't have to wait for the end. I am what? Right now. I am what? Come on, somebody. I am. You don't have to wait for the end. I am right now the resurrection and the life. Not after you felt like you had your act together for 72 hours. Not after you, you know, lived a good life and holy life for a week. Or not after you did some sort of penance or, or you did some sort of remarkable deed. He said, no, no, no. I am right now in the middle of your chaos. In the middle of darkness. In the middle of stuff happening. I am right now. I am right now. You don't have to wait for the end. Look at that. I am what? Right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? And Martha says, all right, I'm in. Amen. Let's pray over this. Father, I thank you. You're a good, good father. I thank you, Father. You are the right now. You are the I am right now. And we thank you for this moment. We thank you for your promises. You have never failed to keep your word. And so we trust your name. This day, Father, let it be impressed in our hearts and lives. Some word that you've spoken to us, I am right now. This amazing word, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to three or four people and just tell them this is going to be good for you. It's going to be really good for you just as you're seated. Paul the Apostle spoke to a church in Corinth. He was talking to him about a number of issues. In fact, most of Paul's letters, which is what uh, most of the New Testament is made up of, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by those guys. And then there were letters named after cities like Galatians and Colossians and Corinthians. And those cities were places where Paul the Apostle had planted a church. First and second, second Timothy were a young man that... He had invested his life into and he's mentoring. And so these letters were letters of correction, letters of explanation, letters of growth, letters of mentoring. And in the letter to the church at Corinth, in the Corinthian letters, he said this. He said, he said we've been like fathers to you. And he said, you have 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers. Now here's the key to that. And I believe it's a key for you and I, and particularly to the fathers here today and the fathers watching online. He said, you have 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers. 
And the key to that is this. An instructor tells you what he knows, but a father gives you who he is. Got that? Write it down. An instructor tells you what he knows, but a father gives you who he is. I believe it's the same for women who are mothers to those who don't have moms and and those who raise up as prayer warriors and those who are raised up to help the younger women. I believe that it's not just about instructing, it's about giving your life. We talked about it yesterday, and Pastor Paul and I talked about it at a meal on Friday. But too often, what we look at church as, because we're we're information people, and particularly my age group, all the old guys, we're like information junkies, you know? And uh, we we grew up in an information culture and the boomers, and, and we're into this thing. And so we just somehow, we've caught this fallacy that if we just get somebody more information... It'll change them. And okay, they haven't changed yet. Well, then cram more information in there. Right? And what we talked about is this. The information easily becomes inspiration. Get some information. We're all psyched up. We're pumped. Yeah. And then it easily becomes evaporation. <laughs> like, dude, I, was, I had it all together the other day. Pastor, man, I was psyched up, and man, I'm just a mess now. Bro, it's Monday. That was yesterday. (laughs) Like, yeah, I know. You know, it's like evaporation quickly. But the fact is, what you and I seek and what we need and what we must have, and that's why the Word of God is so important, is the Word of God gives us a revelation. So write the word revelation. You see, information can become inspiration and, and then becomes evaporation. But a revelation of who Christ is brings an impartation of His presence and from there a transformation in lifestyle. In other words, when we find our true north, our identity, we begin to change the way we make decisions. We talked about it with the men, that all behavior comes from beliefs. What you believe about yourself, what you believe about others, what you believe about other people. In fact, our decisions come from what we believe about our identity and what we believe about God's identity. Who is he? What does he do? How does he feel about me? So that's why fatherhood, that's why our ministry, it's a, we talk about it as a ministry to men, but if you will, it's truly a ministry about raising up fathers. We're really a ministry, if you will, it's a human justice mission focused on defeating fatherlessness and ending child abuse. Because if we change the hearts of men, we change the world. Amen? If we change the hearts of men, we touch the soul of a nation. And that's why somebody asked me, I said, what's the most important thing you can do for your child? And I said to them, I said, I, you know, it was one of those interviews and you, a, the cameras and lights and stuff, and then they throw this question at you. What's the most important thing? And, you know, you don't want to go into that whole, yea, verily, thus saith the Lord God. If you would, you know, just, it's like, How about this? I think the most important thing a father can do for their children is hug them. I mean, think about that. I mean, just a hug. Just the hug and love, because how many of us, even, I've met so many ladies, Judy, and I've met so many young ladies in particular in in our culture today who say, my mom never hugged me. You know, my dad, you know, he was kind of off there somewhere. And so when Father God says to us, I'm like a father to you. What it really means, I will not, I will not, I will not ever let you go. It means I'll I'll always hug you. I'll always be there for you. See, I I believe that the identity of a child, boy or girl, uh, the identity of a child is formed in the breath of their father. When that little child feels the strength of of a father, the strength of masculinity, feels the stubble on a dad's cheek, when that little child feels, smells the fragrance of masculinity when the, there's something that happens. You know, there have been studies done. I just read one from the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, it, it came out in 2006. And it said that the actual touching of a father literally changes the chemical composition of a child. They're studying these things. Medical science over and over now is beginning to prove the things that we know the Word of God has taught us. And so our Father wants to hold us close, and I believe that's one of the most important things. And when that identity begins to find its shape, 
We begin to find our lives because we make decisions based on that identity. And for most of us who have been fatherless, for most of us who haven't had that someone hug us and tell us and affirm us, you know that beautiful picture of Jesus when he's baptized, before he ever did his ministry, and a voice from heaven, his father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He hadn't done anything. It wasn't based on performance. It was based on relationship. And the beauty of following Christ is that relationship, the Bible says, were adopted into his family. Adopted. I have many friends who have uh, children that they've adopted, and, and it reminded me of the story of the little, two little boys, and they're fighting each other, and they're kind of going at it, and they're brothers. But one was biological and one was adopted. And finally, the little biological boy looked at the adopted child and said, Hey, man, yeah, well, you're adopted. And, oh, man, it just kind of pierced the heart of the little adopted boy. And he stopped for a moment, and a little tear in his eye and his head down. All of a sudden, he looked up and he said, Hey, oh, yeah? He said, Well, they had to take you. They chose me. <laughs> Isn't that great? See, that's, that's adopted. That's adopted. He chose us. The Bible says over and over and over, our Father chose us and promised us He would be our Father. He's a good, good Father. And I love this moment where Jesus says to Martha, I am, what? Come on, somebody. I am. I am. I am. In the middle of chaos, in the middle of trouble, in the middle of issues, He is. The resurrection of life. I am. Okay, you know what's divided right here? It's perfect. Center aisle. So we'll do the I am on this side and right now on that side. You ready? I am right now. I am right now. I am right now. Come on, somebody. That's awesome. I am right now the resurrection and the life. Let's get this in our hearts. Let it be impregnated in us that what births out of our lives then is God himself. You know, we don't come to church to arrive at a building called the church. We actually arrive at a building as the church to leave this place and to be the church in culture. That's why I so much appreciate Pastor Paul and Joyce because their hearts are not just about in this building. It's about what we do outside. Amen? From Indonesia to Oxnard. Amen? From Riverside to Orange County. I mean, there's, this, is, this church has a big vision, and that's why I love and appreciate being a part of this. No performance, relationship, that picture for you and I, you know, so often for us, particularly as men, we have this, this picture of what God is, and we have this self-talk. You know, I'm speaking probably somewhere around 150, 160 words a minute if you, if you, if you purchase a... Uh, 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 you know, a book, an audio book, you know, it has on there the number of words per minute that it's speaking, uh, 150, 160 is average. You know, when we're reading, we can read 180 to 200 words a minute. Did you know our self-talk, in other words, what we're talking to ourselves about, is approximately 400 words a minute? So your self-talk right now as I'm speaking, you're talking to yourself about a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> and then about me, and then, oh yeah, I like the shirt. His wife must have picked it out, hey man, she did, and then picked it out again this morning. Hello, somebody. That's how you stay married for 45 years. Come on, somebody. So, yeah, I know, really. I know. Judy goes, don't say that, because then people will start doing the math. Do that. Child bride. Married her before her, she was conceived, you know, just... Chosen. Anyway, 45 years, and you look awesome, baby. Here's what, uh, here's what, I know, see? That's what, that's how you do that. Guys, write these things down. <laughs> Just write it down. That was awesome. Write down this. Flowers work. Flowers are good. Money's good. Write that down, too. Money's good. All the ladies are like, yes! <laughs> All right. Okay, if I go further on that, I'm going to be in trouble. Guys, go, hey, can I see you for a minute? Just want to hit you in the face. <laughs> All right. Here's the, here's the uh, basic ministry of a father 
that a father provides for his children and our father in heaven provides to you and I. And the key attributes of a father are this, love, acceptance, value, intimacy, discipline, and security. Let me hit it again. Love, acceptance, value, intimacy, discipline, and security. In fact, when God created man and mankind, when God created mankind, he, he created everything with a word. He spoke a word, there's mountains. He spoke a word, there's the universe. In fact, an ever-expanding universe, it's, it's expanding at an exponential rate. And, and he spoke all those things into existence. And then when it came to mankind, he did something very different. It says he bent down and he took the earth and took the dirt and with his hands he formed mankind. Because we were made to be close to God. We were made for intimacy. We were made to be close to him. And we find our true north. We find that place of satisfaction, that place of identity, the closer we come to him. See, that's why the Word of God is so important. That's why times of prayer are so important for us, whether it's individually or if you're married with husband and wife, for you to pray together because it creates not only an intimacy with Him, but it creates an intimacy between husband and wife that's found no other place. Prayer produces intimacy. Write it down. Prayer produces intimacy with the one you're praying with, the one you're praying to, and the one you're praying for. Have you ever met someone who came from one of the churches, particularly in Indonesia, and they came and they arrived and you met them and you went, man, I feel like I know you. Why? Because you had been praying for them. You knew their name. You knew their city. They're in this city or that town. And, and then they show up and you go, wow, I feel like I know you. Why? You've been praying for them. Prayer produces an intimacy that happens no other way. And it's one of the least exercised things that we could do freely. And let me share something else with you, particularly because it's a busy world. It, praying in the car counts. Yeah. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Praying in the shower counts. Yeah. All right? It's relationship. It's just about that relationship. And for husbands and wives, for you to pray together, and most often the reason men don't pray with their wives is not out of, uh, you know, not wanting to be the head of the home or priest in the home, but they just don't know the right words. It's why we don't ask for directions. <laughs> now, here's the deal. What people don't know, because it's a funny joke, what people don't know is that men, when they're by themselves, ask for the directions. But when they're with their wife or their children, they don't. <laughs> all right? Can I just... Guys are like, don't give up all our stuff, man. <laughs> is this true? I'm telling a true thing. Because if you're by yourself as a guy, you stop somewhere and go, hey, dude, hey, man, where's so-and-so? But if your wife, with your wife, you go like, I got it. I'm the dad. I'm good. I did that. We were in driving in London with our friends Glenn and Debbie. And finally, the girls who are noticing architectural things, for me and Glenn, we're just trying to find our way back to the hotel. We're driving in London on the wrong side of the road, you know. And uh, finally, Judy and Debbie go, I think we've seen that chandelier in that house three times now. <laughs> she was right. She was right. So what we did is we, this is funny, sidebar. Uh, so we stopped. I found a taxi cab. I stopped behind a taxi. I go up. I go, hey, dude, I give you 20 bucks to drive to the hotel, <laughs> this hotel. So we followed him. <laughs> this is a true story. We followed him. He makes a right turn, left turn, er, stops. It's right there. <laughs> Still worth 20 bucks. Amen. <laughs> So that's what a father provides to you and I. That's what our Father in Heaven provides for us. One last story I want to give to us. Because too often what happens for us, and it's found in John, the second chapter, it's a wedding of Cana. I just want to finish with this. In fact, uh, whoever the, uh, I mean the snap, like, Dina was like, yes. Um, yeah, right now. <laughs> that's awesome. If anybody don't, wants to fill in, just go for it. We'll do like a, uh, a keyboard thing, somebody on the keyboard, because we'll, that makes everybody feel like I'm closing. <laughs> it's like pastors, when pastors say, hey, just one last thought, you go like, no. 
Yeah. Or just, you know, hey, just uh, two more minutes on this. And you're like, yeah. But I want to land this on, on this because I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a picture of the wedding at Cana. And I won't pull out the whole thing. You can find that in uh, some of our messages that we've done. But here's, here's this beautiful picture. It's a wedding at Cana, and it's the opening part of, of the life of Christ in his first ministry. It says that the first th- miracle he ever performed was the wedding at Cana. Anybody know this story? So you got this wedding, and it, it says that Mary's there, and Jesus shows up, and it's like the third day. It's like a three-day wedding. That's crazy, right? I mean, think about that. What are you doing on the third day? Hanging out, going, I don't know, man, just play Michael Jackson. So it's something. You're just hanging out. And so Jesus and, and a few of his guys show up. And uh, Mary, his mom, comes up and she says, she says, they, they've run out of wine. These are friends of mine. It's embarrassing. They've run out of wine. And uh, Jesus says, uh, says, Mom, I'm, well, basically what the Bible says, if you read the translations, most of them say, woman, that, that, what hast thou to do with me? Or what? What has this moment to do with me? She says, well, I need you to do something. He says, it is not my time. Sort of pompous. And I thought, man, Jesus would never talk to his mom like that. These are some old guys in England about 500 years ago that translated this, right? Just like, what has thou to do with me, woman? I'm like, no, no, no. This is your mom, man. It's Father's Day, too, you know. And Jesus, I, I believe what happened is Mary is embarrassed. It's sort of like having family or friends over and 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 you've got a few children and you pass the food down and by the time the food gets past all your children and gets to those guests there's nothing left that's embarrassing right and that's what's happened at this wedding they've run out of wine and and mary's friends are embarrassed and so mary goes to her son and says listen i need you to do something and here's how i think the conversation actually went I think Jesus looked at his mom and said, Mom, I'm not doing that stuff yet. She goes, Son, you're the Messiah. You're the Messiah. We all, we, you and I know this. <laughs> These are my friends. I need you to do something. He's like, Mom, I'm not doing anything yet. I don't even have all the disciples. I got like three guys. <laughs> That's right. So she's like, so here's what happens. And you can read this in the story. It says that she goes over to these servants and she tells them whatever he, this is one of the most, in fact, t- turn your Bible and, and uh, just underline this or highlight it. She says something that's one of the most powerful phrases in the New Testament. She says something about Jesus to these servants and she says to the servants, she says, whatever he says to do, do it. What a great phrase from his mom. Whatever he says to to do, do it. But I love the action at this moment because she's talking to her son. They're having a little discourse. And she finally goes, all right, all right, all right. Messiah thing, all right. She walks over to to these servants and she says, whatever he says to do, do it. And then she turns and walks away. And Jesus is like, and his disciples are like, his guys, his friends with him are going, yeah, what are you going to do? He goes, oh, man. It's my mom. You know, it's, she's going to be a saint someday, you know. Right? And uh, so he goes over and he says to the servants, and this is this amazing moment. There were these jars that said there's these half dozen jars sitting at the front of the house. And these jars would hold somewhere around 30 gallons of water. There's a row of them. Now in that culture, in that day and age, every home at their front door had a jar of water. Now for a wedding, this three-day party, they've got a half dozen jars. And what would happen, you remember the story of Jesus? Remember Jesus washing the feet of his disciples? Remember that? And they said, no, 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 don't do that. The servants do that. He's washing their feet. Why? Because it was something that was custom in that culture. When you arrived at someone's home, their servants would come out, and they would dip a rag into the water of that jar, and they would wash your feet because you're walking on 
these dirty roads that camels have been on and donkeys and people and wagons and there's just stuff, right? And so they wash your feet because you're wearing sandals and dip the rag in and wash the other foot and dip the rag in and wash your hands and then they would take olive oil and put it in your hair and get the dust down and then you would be presented into the home. For three days, these servants have been dipping the wa- a rag into the water, right? <laughs> washing people's feet. Dipping the rag, washing your feet. Hundreds of people in and out. And Jesus says to the servants, put more, just put a little more water in there so they're full. Think about this. He says, then dip a cup into it and give it to your boss. That's what happened, right? It's a true story. So I'm thinking the servants are like, dude, you, you do that. I'm not, I need this job, man. That's right. So, the guy dips the thing in there, they fill it up. He didn't have them empty it. He didn't say, hey, steam clean it, get it cleaned out, all that. So just put some water until it's full. And he said, dip a cup in there, give it to your boss. And so he did that. The guy drank it. They're all like freaked. And he looks up and says, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. He said, this is amazing. I've never tasted anything like this. Jesus said, if you want to know what my father is like, your father. He said, look at these moments, and I believe that this miracle, the first miracle, was about our father. It was at a wedding. It was about covenant. It was about new beginnings. It was about dreams and desires. It was about fresh starts. It was a party. I think God loves parties. I think he loves your dreams. And here's this beautiful moment, and I think we really see the heart of our father. Because he said this, he said, I can take whatever's happened in your life. I can take the dirt of the road of your life. I can take the dust. I can take the mess. I can take the stuff that's happened. I can take all of that, and I can make it beautiful. I can make it the most beautiful wine. Stand with me, please. Revelation 21, I love it. There's a voice from heaven speaking. It's, it's one of the center points of the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is what that book's called. And it says, a voice from heaven speaks out and says, Behold, I make all things new. He's the God of the new and he's the God of the now. I am right now. Come on, somebody. I am. I am. He's the God of the new. When? right now not someplace else not some other day not sometime when you've done everything right I am right now in the midst of the chaos of our lives in what looks like the darkest place the word of God says he's right there hovering ready ready to create new and he took that wine he made it beautiful spectacular The the guy said, why did you save the best for last? And I believe we see in this very start of the ministry of Jesus Christ, we see our Father, the one who loves us, the one who said, I will not, I will not, I will not ever let you go. I'll never relax my hug on you. That's our Father. Father's Day, 2016. Our Father. Our Father. So when Jesus said to pray, Our Father, I pray today that we would no longer see it through the filter of our human experience, but today we would see it in the water being turned into wine and the stuff of our life being made beautiful. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, before we pray, and pastor's going to come and pray with you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is a beautiful scripture. It said, those who are followers of Jesus Christ says they're no longer what they used to be. It says the old things have passed away and it says all things, everybody say all. All All things have become new. All things. 
So you're no longer identified by the things of your past. You're no longer identified by the mistakes you made. I'm not defined as a man by the things I struggle with. I'm defined as a man or a woman by the fact I'm a passionate pursuer of the pleasure of his presence. I'm defined by the presence of God in me. I am not that guy I used to be. You're not that lady you used to be. You're not that person. You're not defined by what somebody said about you in fourth grade. You're defined by what the Word of God says about you. The Word says you're a conqueror, an overcomer, victorious. The Word says you're a champion. The Word says you're His child. The Word says He says, I loved you so much. I gave my son. Romans 5, even when we didn't love Him, He loved us. He's our Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank You right now for this moment. And I thank You, Lord, for Your presence and Your Spirit. There may be some of us here in this room who have, in the journey of life, picked up stuff and things have happened. And Father, I thank you right now we can release that into your hands, the hands of a loving Father. I pray right now as pastor comes to pray, a prayer of commitment and salvation, that Father, at this moment, some of us who because of that filter have resisted really connecting with you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray this moment right now would be such a defining moment, Father's Day 2016, that we connect with our Father and He truly becomes our Father. Father, I pray right now as pastor comes, let me just say this while your heads are bowed, there may be somebody here right now that says, I've never really fully connected with God. I've gone to church. I think maybe I've just been religious. And right now, I'd like the freedom of what I've experienced right now, the presence of God, my Father, through Jesus Christ. This pastor prays with you right now is your time for new. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word.